Part two, <laughs> strap yourselves in for a new season. So there's a need for each of us to deliberately return to the basic orthodoxy of the Apostles' Creed, which says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, worshipped and glorified with the Father and the Son. There's also a need for the church to claim the fullness of God for the fullness of our salvation. Oh, all can be saved to the uttermost. We completely need God and we completely need the completeness of God because the moment that we try to hack bits off God, God becomes less than God's self and we find ourselves not worshipping the true and living God. The church, though, has been beset by people who have become afraid of the Holy Spirit, scared off <laughs> by tales of people being weird or by an unbalanced focus on the things of the Spirit to the exclusion of the Father and the Son early on in their Christian experience. I think growing up in our faith so that we have a proper balance, not a balance whereby we take no notice of anything, but to have the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit working together for the good of the kingdom of God in our lives, rather than too much focus on any one of these persons of the Trinity. So I, I think when we gorge ourselves or, or go hard about Jesus, to the exclusion of Father God, or we go too much about Father with the exclusion of Jesus, and when we go too much on the Holy Spirit, the exclusion of Father and Son, again, with each of those things, there becomes a problem. And the problem is that, that that's where the accusations about the buzziness and the weird stuff um, can, can start to play into people's fears. So, the Christian experience should be about meeting the Father through the Son and experiencing the Holy Spirit who makes that journey to the Father possible. Having said that, let's talk about weird. Let's be really open about it. I'm no stranger to experiencing the weird. I've been pushed down or over by people in prayer. Um, people who've been praying for me and I haven't been doing what they expected have given me just that extra shove to make sure that I got the full experience and uh, little bumps on the head to prove it. And then I've had to go back and prove my charismatic credentials to show that I do know what it means to go down in the spirit and that I'm not just fearing God. Seriously, being shoved isn't nice. But do you know what? Even there, even with a bump on my head, I have known that um, God is my security, God loves me, and it's the Father who is the goal of my faith and the giver of good things. The Son is my saviour and the Holy Spirit, who is the power from on high given for the work of God. He's the counsellor and motivator of faith. And so <laughs> I just try to laugh about it when I'm not feeling cross but when people come to me saying they've experienced the weird I know what they're talking about and I know it's real and I know it can be scary but do you know what the times when I'm most on fire for God the times when my preaching's at its best the times when I'm a better bible teacher the times when I acknowledge that I need to be infilled with power from on high I long for people to know that infilling power of the Holy Spirit, which just breathes life into the ordinary. When they come to know Jesus as their saviour, to have that, that power of God fill them up and wind them up for ministry in whatever way they're called. But there's too many tales of hurt or it being too much. And, and actually, nobody told me about the Holy Spirit is something else that runs deep into the Methodist psyche and our history. Somehow there's been a curse of omission 
spoken over the church when it comes to freedom in speaking, preaching, teaching and practicing the ministry of the full trinity of the God whom we love and worship. And so it's a bit of a challenge to each of us. If as preachers we embrace the Holy Spirit as important and necessary and have an expectation that the Holy Spirit will move and be open to what God is doing, then it takes away that curse of it being weird. And we can laugh about the awkward moments when um, good stewarding of the Holy Spirit's presence has been lacking. You know what? I, I think we've got to a point where we just expect the Holy Spirit to show up at, at times of, um, of mass gathering, looking forward to the event when the Holy Spirit will be there. Well, the Holy Spirit can be there in your living room, in your house group. The Holy Spirit's power and presence can be there in your prayer meeting, in your chapel, Sunday service, evening service. This is ordinary and good and what we should expect. We should expect that the Holy Spirit be present to fuel and engage the words of our mouths. And we should expect that the Holy Spirit meet with us so that we are properly anointed for the task of preaching, teaching and leading. I just want to stop and pause here for a while because Jesus instructed, nearly said ask, but it's clearly an instruction that his disciples wait into Jerusalem until they've received the gift my father has promised, which you heard me speak about. For John baptised with water, but in a few days you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. You know where it is. Chapter 1 of Acts 4 and 5. But it's stronger than that. The gift is to the people Jesus knows, to the people whom he has instructed to wait. They've already met him in resurrection power and now he's going to ascend and the Holy Spirit will come. The purpose is then that the early church gathered in Jerusalem will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes and you will, consequences of it, be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth, verse 8. Our complete salvation is when we're transformed, not just in our intentions to not do the bad stuff anymore, but when we're so thoroughly made in God's image for the purpose of telling and showing the kingdom and the presence of God's love in Jesus, that we will be intentional about it. That transformation is one whereby we're not only released into the fullness of our ministry as preachers, teachers, ministers of God's saving love, but also that we release others into their ministry, just as Jesus left the disciples with that expectation at Pentecost, and just as Peter and Paul went on to release others in their missionary journeys. Have a look in Acts 11, as Peter witnesses to the household in Caesarea. Have a look at Paul in Acts 19. These are accounts of the releasing into full salvation faith for ministry of people who had not yet their saviour known, as we would sing. Holy Spirit is a gift for the equipping of the church for freedom and for service. At the cross of Jesus is resurrection and after resurrection is the ascension and from this, from the Father and the Son, they pour out the gift of the Spirit for the equipping and empowering the church here on earth. Not once and then gone, but that continued empowering until the second coming. Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. We've sung it so many times. Thank you, Melody Green, for those words. But we have to decide if the work on earth is either done and we're here without missional purpose and dynamism, that dynamism of the early church and we're sort of hanging around waiting for the second coming, or we're still doing that work, the work on earth. 
however half-heartedly and however as an afterthought, we're still doing the work of Father God in extending the mission of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. In children's adventure books, right, the hero and the heroine will often set out to find a part of something, something that's been missing, something that will be the key to restoring bounty or good rule in their adventure world. And it's likely that whatever good thing has been kept out of sight is guarded by gatekeepers and powerfully protected so that it's not easily permitted to be released back to where it should be. That's often a deliberate decision to remove the good thing, the thing that leads to fullness of life and prosperity and hope in the kingdom is put to one side. And so the hero or heroine, they, they've got to go on an adventure and there will be stealthy and persistent seeking for the thing that is missing. They, they'll engage in grave peril and danger as it's pursued. But once this thing is discovered and restored, it leads to flourishing, good flourishing. And it leads to goodness. Now then, if the writers of fiction, and it's often post-apocalyptic fiction, have grasped that there is something good, valuable and necessary missing and worth searching for in the world at large, then surely we, as people of the word of God, should be desiring for the fullness of God to fill and fuel our churches with life and power. I'm not alone in this thinking. The late and excellent Billy Graham wrote in his book, The Holy Spirit, in 1978, no less, in order to look biblically and thoroughly at the third person of the Trinity, even reminding his readers that, in his words, I pray that it will be a unifying book. The Holy Spirit did not come to divide Christians, but among other reasons, he came to unite us. Just in there at page eight. So the Holy Spirit is about unity and yet there's been ignoring, setting aside, hiding from, locking away the Holy Spirit's power so that he can't be present in the churches. What people have done with their fear of the Holy Spirit is to stamp out the spark of life in our churches and in the ministries that are misunderstood. We don't let such a body do that because they get out of hand. Ministry in the Holy Spirit needs to come under correct authority. And as preachers, we're under the authority of the local preachers meeting, but also we're under the authority of having been properly trained and equipped. And then we've been given the authority of the church to preach and proclaim that message. So you can do this. You can do this with the blessing of the church. The effect of limiting God is that we limit the extent of our salvation and the extent of our witness. This is hugely problematic. No wonder we become so passive of a church church when our spark of passion has been all but extinguished by an unbalanced doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Now, I did mention that if I were to be doing this live, there would need to be a point of response and the reality is that the distancing issue that we've got going on today shouldn't leave us without that opportunity. I believe that the passivity in the church, the lack of understanding about the transforming love of Jesus at the cross, the disregard for the power, the equipping and the authority of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church has led us to this point. And this has been due to poor teaching and minimal expectations of our preachers. I need to repent of my self-sufficiency and to make room for the work of the Holy Spirit to transfigure and ignite my preaching and the work of ministry to which I am called. And the question I ask now is, do you also need to repent? I believe that we've listened too long to the soft, reasonable tones of the one who wants to see the church fail. These tones have been subtle and they've eaten away at our confidence in the word of God 
and the power of the Holy Spirit to make a difference. We've been listening to the wrong voice. The time has come to repent. Do you? And out of that repentance, out of that, that sense of, of setting aside and allowing the Holy Spirit to clothe and cloak us once again, to infill us and inspire us to be people ignited by faith so that the Holy Spirit breathes life into the words we preach. I believe that there are many of you waiting from the power on high to come upon you and to ignite your lives and your ministries with passion and power for the work of the kingdom. Will you say yes to the Holy Spirit being part of your life and your ministry? Just hold out your hands where you are now, even on the Zoom screen. Come Holy Spirit. Come and meet with us now. We ask for a loosening of lips. We ask for a greater confidence in the word of God. We ask for a boldness in our faith. We ask that we might have the life in all its fullness that you would give us. That we might proclaim and extend your kingdom as you direct us. Lord, we thank you that you are alive and that you breathe your breath of life into us now. We wait on you.